Hello, my name's Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist in London. I assess mentally disordered offenders. I also work as an expert witness, so I give evidence in criminal trials all across the UK. In June 2021, CrimeCon is coming to the UK. It will be full of experts such as myself and also law enforcement agents. They'll also be your favorite YouTubers and podcast makers. So I really hope to see you there. In Kokomo, Indiana, an unthinkable crime terrified residents. A young woman disappeared, apparently kidnapped. After several days of searching, a former FBI profiler narrowed the suspect list to one. Agents and detectives followed the trail across state lines, hoping to find the victim before her time ran. Drops of blood and a torn window screen were all that was left to tell authorities what happened to a woman in Indiana. The 21-year-old victim was snatched from her home on a bright spring morning. She appeared to have no real enemies. There was no clear motive. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In an abduction case, every second counts. This case was plagued by false leads and blind alleys, each one using up valuable time as agents raced to find the victim. Late spring, 1998, Howard County, Indiana. The rural Midwestern farming region was already enduring its first heat wave of the season. Those who weren't farmers stayed inside to avoid the heat. 21-year-old Anita Woldridge was one of them. Um, could you hold on for a second? Thanks. She planned to have lunch with her grandparents and boyfriend before her afternoon shift at a shipping company. Her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up at around noon. I have to go. Okay. But she would never make it. At about 12.30, Anita's mother returned home from work. She was surprised to see her daughter's boyfriend standing out front. Anita's car was gone, but it was unlike her daughter to miss an appointment or to leave the garage door open. Her mother also noticed that the screen from the kitchen window that faced the garage had been removed. Perhaps someone had broken into the house the front door was unlocked. Anita! Anita was nowhere to be found. Anita! Anita! In the kitchen, Mrs. Woldridge spotted blood on the kitchen table and floor. Oh my God. Uh, yes, uh, I need... She called 911. Howard County Sheriff's Anita. Chief Detective Steve Rogers responded to the call. I don't know that any of us really knew exactly what we had at that time. We just knew that we had uh, some very suspicious circumstances. We had what appeared to be uh, a possibly a forced entry and that the screen had been removed and that some blood indicated that there could have been a violent act. The detective issued an APB for Anita and her blue sedan and called in a forensic team that included officers from the nearby city of Kokomo. Technicians recorded the scene while the evidence was still fresh. They retrieved blood from the kitchen, but could not determine if it was Anita's without a sample from the missing girl. The screen found in the garage had been forced out from the kitchen window. Investigators dusted the area for prints. None that were lifted yielded any clues. 
Detectives interviewed Anita's parents to learn more about their daughter. They described her as a responsible young woman who held a steady job and who would never break plans without calling. We had a missing person that was responsible and would not have just run off. We found nothing in our uh, interviews with witnesses, uh, talking to family members that Anita had any problems at home, that she would have just taken off without any explanation. Okay, good. I need to know what the detective were. questioned Anita's boyfriend, who she had been dating for several months. He claimed to have arrived at Anita's at about 11.45 and had been there for 45 minutes when her mother pulled up. Before that, he had been with friends until around 11. That left 90 minutes during which his activities could not be corroborated. He had no idea where Anita might be and agreed to come to the station for further questioning if necessary. Authorities examined Anita's bedroom. Mrs. Wooldridge pointed out that Anita's work clothes were still there. She spoke to her daughter's supervisor, but he said Anita had not yet arrived. Supervisor's name is Mr. Johnson. Four five one two three four five. The detective called again to see if she had ever shown up. Her employer told us that, you know, she shows up when she's got a cold, she works when she's not feeling well, she's very dependable. Uh, and then the fact that she didn't show up for work that particular day was very significant. Mrs. Wooldridge said that the only thing missing from Anita's room was a red bathrobe that she had recently embroidered for her daughter. Forensic technicians retrieved hair samples from Anita's brush to begin the lengthy process of mapping her DNA. In the bathroom, Anita had left her glasses and contacts behind. She couldn't drive without them. But her car and her keys were gone. Mr. and Mrs. Wooldridge had also discovered that their bed had been stripped of its comforter and the sheets were rumpled. Investigators suspected that Anita may have been raped there. Forensic technicians processed the room for any physical evidence. Okay. They examined the bed with ultraviolet light, searching for seminal fluid on the sheets and blankets. The bedding was clean. In the garage, a detective found a wad of electrical tape Long strands of hair that resembled Anita's were tangled inside. Police suspected it had been wrapped around the victim's head to hold a gag. If that were true, it may have meant that Anita was taken from the house alive. Detectives spread out from the house looking for witnesses. There was a neighborhood search conducted by talking to neighbors and walking areas and um, see if she had been seen anywhere. Uh, and at the same time, we were trying to develop any, po any potential suspects by talking to um, people that, that she routinely came in contact with. A deputy interviewed a neighbor who lived across the street from the Wooldridges. He remembered seeing someone in front of their house that morning. At about 10.30, the neighbor spotted a man carrying a blue backpack heading towards the front door. He saw no one else outside after he returned from his errand a half hour later. He couldn't remember if Anita's car was gone by then. Deputies were left with only hunches as to what had happened. We assumed that the worst could be uh, an abduction, but we definitely knew we had a missing person. Um, so we just wanted to at least, uh, at, the, at the very outset, cover the, all the basics of preserving the crime scene, uh, um, obtaining any evidence that we possibly could, and then start in the next stage of the investigation, which would be doing as much background on the victim and trying to identify a suspect in, uh, in an abduction if that's what's happened. After 24 hours and dozens of interviews, no one had seen Anita 
or her car. Detectives interviewed a man who was a friend of Anita's father. Well, not really. He claimed that he had spoken to Anita on the phone the morning that she disappeared. The Wooldridge's records confirmed it. Can you tell me about the phone conversation? The man said he called at about 10.30 or so and asked to speak to Mr. Wooldridge. Hey. Anita did. said her father wasn't there and that she was the only one home. Before she could take a message, she asked him to hold on. Someone was at the door. Anita came back to the phone only to say she had to go. She did not say who had come to the house. Increasingly, detectives were convinced that Anita met with foul play. I've got to go. Did she say who was up? If this was a kidnapping, investigators suspected that whoever was responsible would make contact with the Wooldridges. Technicians tapped the family's phone line. They would be ready if a call came in. Investigators also began to search for anyone who might have had reason to harm Anita. We had no immediate suspects other than we started looking into all those people that had been in contact with Anita recently. Detectives interviewed Anita's co-workers at the shipping company. They claimed Anita didn't have any problems with anyone at the job. But they did remember something a few weeks before she disappeared. At a place where the employees often went to relax, Anita's co-workers saw a man approach Anita. He worked with them at the shipping company and had had several drinks before he started teasing Anita. Anita was polite but clearly annoyed. The witnesses thought he didn't appear too happy that Anita had brushed him off. They added that the man had not shown up for work the day that Anita disappeared. And you can tell by the look on her face she did not like it. Detectives went to question the employee who was at home. He claimed that his encounter with Anita in the restaurant was an innocent exchange. We're friends, we're co-workers. On the morning she disappeared, he said he came into work before his shift and explained to his supervisor that he needed the day off. He wanted to work on his car. His supervisor confirmed the alibi. Sorry for the interruptions, but these are questions. As the hours ticked by, family and friends posted missing persons flyers throughout the area. They asked for anyone to call with information about their daughter or her car. They also contacted the media to spread the word beyond Kokomo. Air surveillance and concerned citizens fanned out across the rural region to assist officers in the search. A lot of lanes and back roads are in the uh, extreme portions of this county. We had volunteer groups. The uh, uh, Civil Defense uh, actually went out and formed uh, organized searches of wooded areas. We felt that if we could find her vehicle, that that would give us some evidence to lead us in, in another direction. 48 hours after Anita had disappeared, Detective Rogers received a promising tip from the mother of one of Anita's friends. The woman reported that Anita was having problems with another co-worker at the shipping company. Anita said that the man had sexually harassed her on the job. She was concerned enough to file a complaint against him. Anita told the mother that if she wound up in a dumpster somewhere, you would know who did it. Investigators hoped they could find her before it was too late. They knew every hour she was gone lessened the likelihood Anita would be found alive. Did he say anything about Detectives returned to the shipping company. The supervisor told them that he had no record of a sexual harassment complaint filed against the employee. 
He added that the man had resigned three weeks earlier and left the state for college. The suspect remained on the list until detectives could determine his whereabouts at the time of Anita's disappearance. While the lead was being checked, investigators continued their search for suspects in the area. They asked Anita's boyfriend to take a lie detector test since his alibi could not be corroborated on the morning Anita went missing. The test consisted of only two questions. Did he have anything to do with the disappearance of Anita Woldridge? And did he know where Anita could be found? He answered no to both, but was found to be deceptive. He remained a suspect, though police had no evidence with which to hold him. After two days of searching, investigators were no closer to finding the missing woman. And the chances that she was still alive decreased with each passing day. Two days after 21-year-old Anita Woolridge disappeared from her suburban home in Indiana, Howard County sheriffs had identified her co-worker and her boyfriend as possible suspects in her abduction. Though evidence found at her house suggested that she'd been taken alive, investigators knew that time was against them. Detectives spoke to Anita's friends to find out more. Most conveyed that they didn't know anyone who would want to hurt Anita, especially her boyfriend. One friend, who had previously worked with Anita at a gym two years earlier, said that Anita was nice to everyone, including difficult people. She recalled a member from the gym whose behavior towards the women there was crass. What's wrong? His name was Victor Steele. They found him offensive. Is that Steele? Yes. But he remained undeterred. Steele bothered Anita in the same way. No, no. Oh, no, I'm not a towel. Yeah, I'll take that. But she remained characteristically polite when she rejected him, according to Detective Steve Rogers. What did I do? Anita uh, w was a personality that she was always very forgiving and, and willing to try to work with anyone and that she had made an extra effort to try to get along with this individual. That, um, the man's behavior never changed and his membership was eventually terminated. -E -E. Anita's friend remembered that Victor Steele lived in Howard County at the time. Investigators checked on Steele's background. When his name came up, uh, we were able to locate uh, his name in the Indiana Sex Offender Registry and learned from that that he had been convicted in Monroe County, uh, I believe in 1984, of an abduction. Though Detective Rogers didn't know if Steele had any contact with Anita in the past two years, he believed Steele was the most promising suspect so far. To substantiate his theory, the detective turned to retired FBI profiler Steve McVeigh for guidance. He had uh, three or four people that he had to, to look at as suspects. He's uh, wanting to see if we can narrow these down and to give uh, some focus to the case. Uh, he has limited resources and certainly time was the most critical of those. And, and if we could focus, then uh, we'd be a little bit better off. The profiler examined the crime scene reports and the backgrounds of each suspect. 41-year-old Victor Steele's background stood out. The circumstances surrounding Steele's conviction 15 years earlier had many similarities to Anita's disappearance. In December of 1984, Steele had stalked a woman on an Indiana University campus where he was a student. One night, he waited outside for her boyfriend to leave. Like Anita, the young woman had previously turned down his advances. Knowing she was alone, Steele approached the house. When the woman answered her door, Steele pushed his way inside. He pulled a knife from a blue backpack and threatened to kill her if she did not submit to being raped. He'd had contact with her. Uh, he didn't live all that far from her. 
He carried the backpack that he had, as same as in the first instance, which he used as a crime kit, where he brought his tape, his ropes, and whatever else that he was going to use. And uh, that's very, very distinctive. After raping her, he forced her to walk with him at knife point. He told her to act like they were lovers or else he would stab her. The profiler recognized that part of Steele's fantasy was to feel like he was her boyfriend. He had hoped to make this gal love him, his victim love him. Uh, he, he didn't look at it as a rape. Now, 15 years later, if, if it were, were the same guy, he would have the same signature, but he would be more sophisticated about it. Most importantly, Steele did not kill his victim. He released her on the condition that she would not call the cops. She agreed, then ran to the nearest phone to call 911. Victor Steele was arrested hours later. I think that he looks back on the case in 1984 as a mistake, that he, uh, that he was not thorough enough in indoctrinating her or winning her over as, uh, as sufficiently as he thought he had. And then when he let her go, she identified him and sent him to prison. Victor Steele served eight years behind bars for first degree rape and abduction. He was distraught open over the two, conviction. Guys, open two. In prison, Steele attempted suicide twice. If he had abducted Anita, he was not going to make the same mistake again. Victor Steele wanted to find a lady that he could, in effect, make love him. And uh, if he couldn't, if it didn't work, then he was prepared, in my opinion, to kill her. And so love me or I'll kill you is a very succinct uh, description of what went on in this case. The profiler stressed the importance of not revealing the investigation to Steele. So Mike, uh, Steve, what if the suspect felt this? police were on to him, he, he would probably kill Anita and himself. Kokomo City Detective Michael Holzapple was called in to work undercover and help locate the suspect. The task of finding him involved us immediately in doing a, a surveillance of his last known residence, which was the home of his mother, which was on the outskirts of our city here in Howard County. Two and a half days after Anita disappeared, police set up outside the Steele residence. No one was seen entering or leaving. They needed a way to find out who was inside without blowing their cover. A car parked in front might be their way in. We observed that there was a vehicle for sale outside of his house. Uh, we seized on that as an opportunity to establish contact under a ruse of being interested in making the purchase of the car, recognizing that we wouldn't have to compromise our identity. Posing as potential buyers, undercover officers wearing wires prepared to make contact with whoever was home. They had no idea if Steele or Anita were inside. The suspect might do anything to protect his freedom. Every moment's delay dwindled the possibility that Anita remained alive. In June of 1998, investigators searched for convicted rapist Victor Steele in the abduction of a missing Indiana woman. Two and a half days after her disappearance, police set up surveillance outside his last known residence. Undercover detectives posing as used car buyers plan to make contact with the 41-year-old suspect. Though each hour that passed decreased the victim's chances for survival, Kokomo City Detective Michael Holzapple believed that there was still hope. A sexual predator would enjoy a sense of self-assurance by way of his having made it from the scene with his captive victim. Uh, that that probably presented a window of opportunity to, to, uh, to us as investigators that she would still be kept alive. Wired for their own safety, they knew that approaching the house may put the victim at risk if Victor Steele discovered that he was a suspect, according to retired FBI profiler Steve McVeigh. I told him, tell your guys you've got to be extremely discreet 
uh, in this whole investigation, although we must press because time is of the essence, uh, we have to do it in such a way that it arouses absolutely zero suspicion on Victor's part. And if he had any suspicion whatsoever that, that he had come under suspicion of the police, then he would dispose of her. An older woman answered the door. She told the undercover detectives that the car for sale belonged to her son, Victor. The detectives said they were ready to buy now and were invited inside to discuss the price in the vehicle's history. The mother claimed that her son had moved to Wisconsin a few weeks earlier. Without her permission or a warrant, detectives were unable to search the house independently. They believed she was not likely involved, but they weren't convinced that she wouldn't alert her son to the search. She added that Victor hadn't hooked up his phone yet in Wisconsin, so she had no way to reach him. No, no, he's She would have to speak with him before she could set a price. The detectives promised to keep in touch and looked forward to speaking to the owner himself. The FBI profiler remained confident Victor Steele was the primary suspect. We could not eliminate him, and in fact, the secure place that, that uh, I thought he would have taken her to and where he could spend a significant amount of time with her could, might very well be in a totally different area where no one knew him at all and no one would uh, have any idea of looking for him there and that he very likely had gone and prepared a place and had in fact come back and taken her without his mother ever even knowing him. 24-hour surveillance by undercover officers continued as other team members discreetly gathered more background on Steele. They learned he was unemployed and owned a red pickup, but they could not figure out where he was staying. With each passing day, pressure to find the suspect and the victim mounted upon Howard County Chief Detective Steve Rogers. We wanted to find this young lady alive. People were looking at us and saying, well, gosh, can't you do something? And uh, we weren't at liberty to talk about what we were doing and what we, what we thought we could get done. Uh, we had to be very guarded with that information. Victor Steele's credit card statements revealed that he had rented a truck in Indiana a few days before the crime. Company records showed that Steele had traveled 910 miles round trip. Investigators divided the distance in half and traced a 450-mile circle around Kokomo, Indiana. One town that intersected was La Crosse, Wisconsin. Steele's credit card records also showed that he purchased gas at a convenience store on the date he rented the truck. Detectives called the parent company to determine the store's location. It was near La Crosse, Wisconsin. They notified the FBI that it was likely Victor Steele had crossed state lines with the victim. FBI Special Agent David Fitzgerald of the Eau Claire, Wisconsin Resident Agency was assigned the case. We were able to offer them the ability to, to bring in other agents if need be to uh, conduct investigation um, anywhere within the state of Wisconsin. And if things were going to lead out of the state of Wisconsin, uh, the FBI is, is one of those agencies that has a network in place where we can contact people all over the country uh, to help them out. Six days after 21-year-old Anita Woldridge disappeared, her missing blue sedan was found close to her home on a suburban street in Howard County, Indiana. It was just a few miles from Steele's house. The car was unlocked, and the keys were still in the ignition. Investigators feared Anita's body might be stashed in the trunk. She was not there, but her red bathrobe was. Underneath, they found evidence that was more encouraging. Severed electrical ties, 
this was a very important thing with the profiler. he indicated to us that if these had been used to secure her arms or legs that when they were cut from her that would be to assist her in getting out of the vehicle there was a good possibility that she was at least alive when she was taken out of the trunk detectives found no blood seminal fluid or other signs of struggle in the vehicle nor did they find fingerprints far into the car from the driver's side window they were able to lift what they believed was an elbow print technicians preserved it in the hopes it would match their suspect Detective Rogers asked the profiler whether they should allocate a portion of his limited resources to the search in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Steve Rogers asked me if, if I thought it was worth him taking a troop of his people uh, to uh, Wisconsin to look for. We even had the name of a town where a gas purchase had been made. Now, that was really iffy uh, in terms of that specific town being exactly where she, uh, he had her. That part I was not certain at, at all about, but we had nothing else at that point. A contingent of Indiana detectives headed for La Crosse, Wisconsin, where they believed Steele had taken Anita. They met with Special Agent David Fitzgerald and La Crosse police at a command center in the city of 50,000. They really didn't have any specific information that Victor was here and he was here now. Uh, nor did they have any specific information that the victim, Anita, was here and, and was here now. Um, and they kind of looked at us and said, you guys must think we're crazy for being here. But, you know, they had been up for a day and a half and felt pretty strongly that something was going to happen in our area. And we were just there to help them. Not wasting any time. That evening, investigators split up into several teams looking for Steele's red pickup truck on the streets of La Crosse until four in the morning but without an address or even a general location of where Steele and his victim may be. The search was fruitless. Once again, they turned to FBI profiler Steve McVeigh to help eliminate locations. They asked me whether they were looking for a life a victim or a dead body. I replied that it was most likely that she was still alive and would be as long as he thought he could control her and that, uh, and that he was not under suspicion by the police, uh, that he would keep her for a fairly significant amount of time. He would keep her in a place that he had uh, absolute control over and felt totally secure. Investigators clung to hope that a week after her disappearance, Anita Wooldridge was still alive. Seven days after 21-year-old Anita Wooldridge had disappeared from her suburban Indiana home, Authorities believed it was possible that she was still alive. They suspected convicted rapist Victor Steele was holding her somewhere in La Crosse, Wisconsin. But Chief Detective Steve Rogers had no proof and no known address. We had a hope that she was alive. We did not know that she was alive. This was our last ditch effort um, to, to find her. Um, in the sense of finding her alive, that we had to get there, set up a command post, and be ready for when we received the information where he could possibly be. To get it, undercover detectives wearing hidden transmitters returned to Steele's last known residence, his mother's home in Howard County, Indiana. Posing as interested buyers for the suspect's used car out front, officers hoped to glean Steele's whereabouts from his mother. Kokomo City Detective Michael Holzapple was aware of the danger. Our concern was that if we were discovered making our inquiries regarding Victor Steele at this stage of the investigation, that we might be contributing to the murder of this victim, that it might place her life at immediate risk. It was a risk they had to take. His mother maintained that she still didn't have a telephone number for her son in Wisconsin. But she did have an address. The undercover officer repeated the address out loud to his partner so it could be heard by detectives listening outside. He immediately called Chief Detective Steve Rogers at the FBI office in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Captain, I got the address. My team people are in the street with the uh, La Crosse uh, Police Department and the La Crosse FBI. And I'm relaying this information, and uh, at that particular point, when I tell them, do you have a Clinton Street in La Crosse? And they looked at me rather strange and said, yes. Uh, I said, that's where he's at. 
FBI and lacrosse detectives arrived in minutes. They identified the red pickup truck parked outside as Victor Steele's. As soon as Victor Steele's vehicle and residence were, in fact, under surveillance, I requested assistance uh, with the local authorities there to go to a local court, a uh, local magistrate, and apply for a search warrant for the address on Clinton Street and for Victor Steele's vehicle and for the person of Victor Steele. While they waited for the warrants, agents contacted the owner who lived close by to find out if Steele had in fact rented the house. He confirmed the suspect was his tenant. Steele had claimed that he wanted to turn the building into a bookstore. The landlord provided a sketch of the building's interior layout. He also gave the FBI a key to the front door. Outside the rental property, investigators consulted the FBI profiler. They asked him what the chances were that Steele was holding Anita inside the building. Profiler Steve McVeigh warned that if she was there, getting to her safely would be difficult. They were trying to determine whether they needed to storm the place or whether that was even the place that he would have her or not. So I, I, I was confident he did in fact have her there. She would be very well secured. I did tell him that I thought there was at least a 50-50 chance that should they attempt to storm the place while he's there, that he would kill himself and kill her too. Investigators had no way to confirm who was inside. If they waited to go in, they might be too late. We were again calculating with the resounding thump of this clock ticking in the back of each of our minds and our hearts as to whether or not do we make an entry, do we wait. Do we stage a surveillance, watch and wait? Do we go ahead and force an entry? That decision was in part made by us witnessing Victor Steele leave the residence. After a week of searching, investigators got their first glimpse of the suspect. He climbed into his truck and drove away. The surveillance team followed, but decided it would be imprudent to stop him for questioning. One of the risks that we did face is that, say, he had uh, Anita at another location that was not the residence, and he decided that he did not want to cooperate with us, and he just left. He may never go to that place again, and we may never find Anita. Agents tracked Steele to a lumber yard. A detective followed the suspect inside. Steele seemed interested in long planks of wood. I witnessed him make purchase of lumber. That in itself was a chilling observation and a bit of information to convey back to the surveillance team uh, because we had thoughts in mind, what's he using lumber for? To make a, a cage, to make a coffin. The detective reported back to the other investigators. They watched as Steele returned to his pickup with the lumber. Investigators continued their tale. Steele retraced the route he had taken from his rental property. They had to decide soon if they were going to risk stopping him without knowing for sure where he was going or where he had stashed Anita. If he had her alive and she was somewhere else, he would have went to her by now. But since he had not been away from the residence to any other location, we felt strongly that she, if she was alive, that she would still be there at that residence. 
they decided they weren't going to let Steele return to the rental property. Take him down, take a him down. A lacrosse detective radioed to a uniformed officer to stop the pickup. The decision would mean the difference between life and death for Anita Woolridge. Eight days after a 21-year-old Indiana woman was abducted from her home, the FBI and local authorities stopped the prime suspect in La Crosse, Wisconsin. They believed Victor Steele was holding Anita Woolridge in a rented house nearby, but they had no proof that she was there or that she was still alive. Since they did not have enough to arrest the suspect, a La Crosse police cruiser pulled the pickup to the side of the road on the pretense of a routine traffic stop. Then the FBI approached. Special Agent David Fitzgerald asked the suspect if he would assist in their investigation. He wasn't under arrest, and I, I didn't want to make him feel like he was. I had no probable cause that I was aware of at that time to arrest Mr. Steele, and I just wanted to, to have a conversation with him. Steele agreed to cooperate and accompanied agents back to the FBI office. The sex offender claimed to know nothing about Anita Woldridge's disappearance and lied about where he was living. Mr. Steele indicated that he thought that he had been stopped by law enforcement officers for his failure to register as a sex offender in the state of Wisconsin. And he indicated that he had been in Wisconsin for a couple days uh, and that he was staying in his truck. At Steele's rental property, investigators prepared for entry. They would be ready when they got word the warrant was signed by a judge. It was a difficult wait for Detective Michael Holzer. The greatest anxious moments uh, of the investigation I, I would describe occurred in awaiting the arrival physically of a search warrant that was being then prepared at our command center. Uh, we had Victor Steele. He was no present threat to anyone. We didn't know what the condition or circumstance uh, Anita was suffering at that moment. They got the warrant. The entry team used the key provided by the landlord. They exercised extreme caution, aware that the place may be booby-trapped. Anita, police! Officers swept through the rooms, including the basement, announcing their presence. But the team heard no answer to their calls. Closet clear. Closet clear! It appeared they had been wrong. At the FBI office in La Crosse, an agent and detective continued their interview with Victor Steele. Nope. The suspect admitted that he once knew a woman named Anita from a health club, but he hadn't seen her for a while. Without Steele's cooperation, investigators realized they may never find Anita. And they didn't have enough to place him under arrest. Again, Mr. Steele indicated that he couldn't help law enforcement officers. Uh, he talked about the fact that he was uh, not under arrest, he was detained, and he basically said, do what you gotta do to get me out of here. Anita! FBI! In the last room, authorities spotted a large metal cabinet lying face up on the floor. Its doors appeared to be secured with a broken broom handle and a butter knife. We didn't communicate verbally at, at that particular time, but the communication was clear that we wanted to be cautious of booby traps. We wanted to be cautious about disturbing evidence, but we needed to open that cabinet. The team members believed, dead or alive, the search for Anita was at an end. They saw no suspicious devices attached to the box, nor did they hear movement from within. Carefully, they freed the cabinet's handles. Anita? 
After eight days, yes. Anita was alive. It, it was hard for me to believe that it was really going to be over. And they open the box, and there's like five or six police officers standing there. And I'm like, thank God, take me home. Anita Wooldridge told her rescuers that though she was not gagged, she had been conditioned by Victor Steele not to call out. He told me he might make fake noises, so if I would scream for help, then he would kill me. And then when the police actually came to the door, I was still afraid to scream because I thought he might be playing a tape or making it up. She was handed over to the emergency medical technicians. Except for dehydration, she remained healthy even after her long ordeal. Victor Steele was placed under arrest for kidnapping and sexual assault. He remained unfazed. Victor really was not remorseful about what he had done. It, it, it appeared to me that it, if there was any remorse, it was in the fact that he had been caught. From the health club where you Anita had little to eat during her captivity. She ate her first meal, as she explained to investigators the events that began eight days earlier. Victor Steele arrived at her home at about 10.30. She recognized him from the health club and invited him in. He told her he had been out riding a bike and asked if he could come in for a glass of water. Didn't seem like a big deal that he came to the door. I knew he rode his bike everywhere, and I mean, it was really hot that day. And I just never second thought I was going to get him a glass of water, send him on his way. Anita asked Steele to wait while she wiped up blood from the kitchen floor where she had cut herself earlier. When her back was turned, Steele drew a stun gun from his backpack. I didn't know what was happening. It was all so fast. And I realized, like, you know, I'm being attacked. And I started screaming, even though I knew no one's going to hear me. All the windows are shut and air conditioners are on. And then when he hit me in the stomach, it's just, I lost all control of my legs. Like, they just went limp. Steele disguised himself in women's clothes before he left the house. He first grabbed the bedspread, then Anita's robe to cover her bound wrists. He tried to shove her out the kitchen window, but decided it was easier to walk her to the car. He locked her in the trunk. Before taking her to Wisconsin, he brought her to his mother's house and raped her. I'd always thought I'd rather die than be raped, and, and then it was almost like survival mode took over my body. It was like, okay, we're going to get through this, and I'm going to do everything in my power not to die like this and have my parents with unanswered questions. So you understand me? Get in. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, right. Steele showed her a metal wardrobe yeah. that would be her hand. new home. He threatened to kill her if she tried to escape. Anita agreed not to try, but Steele didn't trust her. He left a quarter on top of the wardrobe to indicate if she tried to get out. I didn't like being confined like that, but at least if I was in there, I knew he couldn't touch me. But it also made it very dreadful every time I heard the box open because I knew I was either going to have to play games with him or be raped or he had to see him. Anita returned home to the warm welcome of friends and family. Detective Michael Holzapple was surprised the case ended as well as it had. Having worked so many broken bodies, so many fractured stories, so many occasions that it didn't, it didn't come out like you would wish, that you would hope. Although this, this young woman suffered a, an incredibly uh, uh, a devastating victimization, she's still alive and uh, People work together to support her in bringing her home alive. Victor Steele acted as his own attorney in his January 1999 trial and was convicted of kidnapping, carjacking, and weapons possession. 
He was sentenced to life without parole and serves his time in the United States Penitentiary in Beaumont, Texas. I think my goals in life are a little bit different. I never thought of doing anything in law enforcement, and now that's something I'm looking into, that I would like to do that to help other people. And um, it just it gives me a goal that, you know, I want other people like him off the streets. And so that's a little bit different than my original plan in life. The life-changing experience would have shattered many others. But Anita Woldridge transcended her ordeal because of her strong personality and individual faith. She now hopes to become an FBI agent to help others as they helped her.